Hey guys, Kyle here. So, just before the show starts, I wanted to mention our Patreon. You can pay us $1 a month as a thank you, as a tip. You can pay $2 a month to get access to one of our bonus content shows, uh, episodes two days early, and a secret Discord chat where all of our Patreon donors get to go and hang out and talk with us directly. Then there's a $5 tier that you can donate to to get access to a whole bunch more content. Uh, we have multiple bonus episodes on there. So please check it out, patreon.com slash it gets weird. Uh, we don't advertise, we don't make money. So check it out and throw some money if you think that would be cool. Thanks. Welcome to It Gets Weird, our comedy show where we explore the unusual, the unbelievable, and the unexplained to try to make your world a little weirder. I'm Niall, and returning this week to finish out the mini-series that you've all been waiting for, we've got... Because I always finish exactly. what I start. Yeah, You've never left a thing undone in I've, your life. I, I truly have never abandoned a project out of dis- disinterest after very excitedly starting it. Yeah. Uh, Do you know the part of uh, part of what I consider my lore, okay. distinct lore about myself is that there was a year probably when I was like 12. I was like decently young, but old enough. Old enough to know better. I I'm just going to start I'm going to say that now before you tell me the rest of the story just to assume. I begged my mother to buy me a guitar. I begged I and do know begged this. and pleaded <laughs> and I said, "I swear to God, I will learn how to play it. I was like, I knew that the reason she wouldn't want to buy it for me was that I am a flake who doesn't finish things. Yeah. And I was like, this is going to be the time I'm really going to do it. But the thing is, and this is a hundred percent. I'm the asshole. I was the dickhead 12 year old who she bought me a guitar and I did not learn how to play it, but she didn't give me lessons. Yeah. Okay. Did did she She get like a book or anything? She gave me a guitar, a book, printed out a bunch of tabs and stuff for me. And then she kind of showed me because my mom knows how to play guitar. She showed me some things. But at that point in my life, I really, and I still do, I need someone to say like, you have to be here at this time doing this thing. Yeah. That's the only way to get me to do it. And so no one was saying to me, on Tuesdays after school, you have to practice guitar. So I just didn't. (laughs) And I never learned. And I still don't know how to play. I couldn't play a single fucking note on a guitar. I couldn't. Not a single one? I mean, I could hold one of the strings and yeah, pluck I it. Say, I understand how a guitar works, but I couldn't play an actual chord. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't ask couldn't, for something and you'd be able to play a chord. Or but a, I could play do a deer on piano. Oh, yeah? I can do that still. I okay. learned that once, and that literally is just you just keep going up the octave. So you just you do one motion over and over. Yeah. I can't resolve the song. I can't do the end of it, but I can do the little do, 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 do. I do that. There you go. That's all you need, really. I can't do it on guitar. <laughs> I'll teach you smoke on the water and then we'll be good. Yeah. You, we can knock that out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but so that that is, I feel, extremely indicative of my character to this day. Please buy me the guitar. Please, please, please. I swear to God, I'll learn how to play it. And then I just don't. Yeah, I carry around the folder for a long time though that has all the tabs and stuff in it. I carried that around everywhere I went. Yeah, and, and that's I important. Thought a lot about being a person who could play guitar. You you were doing the think system for guitar. Yes. Yeah. God, I wish this think system was real. My whole life would be so different if the think system was real. Because I think about shit a lot, Niall. <laughs> I, look, as someone who lives with you, uh, I I am fully aware. Uh, I think about being the kind of person who's good at stuff. <laughs> I think about what that would be like so much. So much. Um, you yeah. know what? And you know what? I'm I'm about to throw. Here's I'll throw this out the window. Guess what? What? My name's Jules. Oh shit! That's my fucking name. Now it, it does it count if you did it like. Three full minutes after I tried to introduce you. That's the secret. There you go. All right. (laughs) It's me. And Kyle's not fucking here. Yeah, he's still shitting himself. No, guess what? He feels fine. He just didn't want to see you guys. He told me that he didn't like you guys. And I'm here because I like you. There you go. Let's start. 
we're like I you think, guys being the listeners yes I, th- I think year eight is about the right time to start like inter podcast beef and and so I, mean, I, think, I try to start shit every time i'm on true. this podcast without one of you when when i when i've been on and it's just me and kyle i immediately throw you under the bus this is just i'm very open about it yeah no one can feel betrayed because they, they they know it's coming you I'm, know i i just i'm a messy bitch who loves drama <laughs> Speaking of, um, that means I'm guessing you're you were very into these episodes of of encounters. Oh, what 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 are we doing today, Niall? Oh, did you even introduce joy. the podcast? Did I, you do it? I kind of did before we got entirely sidetracked with lore. Well, uh, we're trying to make your world a little weirder. Did you get to that part? I did. I okay. did that. Yeah. So, um, I did it looking like looking you dead in the eye. And so it's, it's a little weird that you don't remember. I but. was thinking about guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I got my own shit going on, hey, Niall. I know, I know. But luckily, you did have time to squeeze in two episodes of Amblin Televisions presented by Netflix, Encounters, uh, where this week we watched episodes three and four, which were, which I guess conclude the miniseries. I don't know if this thing is optioned for a second season yet or not. Maybe, maybe, hey, maybe Spielberg will come in on season two and, and touch up some direction and like I, take over episode one. If, you know? if Spielberg is credited as like anything other than producer or whatever the fuck he's already credited as. If he like came back and directed one, I would absolutely come back and watch it for that. Yeah, of course it's part of the canon now. Uh, so the episodes are episode three, the Broadhaven triangle and then episode four lights over Fukushima. Um, so if you didn't listen to the part one of this, we watched the first two episodes last week and we talked, we talked about those. So if you want to go back and listen to that, we're going to come in as if I'm assuming you've listened to that. Yeah. Assuming that you, you are, are aware of what's happening. So now these episodes are, are not, um, they do build upon each other. I think in terms of kind of developing a central thesis, which I will, will get to, but they are not like connected in terms of through lines. So you could just watch a single episode of the show and be fine. Yeah. I think you could um, watch any of them individually and they all have, the ideas that are in all four are are in all four. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I guess we'll start with episode. Th- Actually, do you have do you th- do you think that there is one episode that's better than the other in, in terms of three and four? I mean, I think the fourth episode is the worst episode of the whole thing. I would agree. I think I think the fourth episode is like a weird thrown together mess of a bunch of ideas that they didn't really uh, 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 tighten into a thing very should I, well. Should I just say my ranking? I could rank the episodes. Really oh, go for easily it right now. It would probably be for me two, three, one, four. Okay. So you liked the aerial school versus over. Uh, so it goes aerial school, Broadhaven triangle, then uh visitor, whatever we called the first episode it was like called visitors or something. Yeah. Um, that was the about Texas the one. Texas one. Yeah. And then all of that over lights over Fukushima. Yeah. I think that the, 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 the first episode and the fourth episode do the thing the most that is like how to phrase. Uh, there's no other explanation for this except for this. Anytime someone says that in a documentary, I always am like, there are a million explanations for anything. Yeah. This isn't not just a supernatural documentary, like any documentary that tries to be like, explicitly says to you there's no other explanation it has to be this it's just not true about yeah. almost anything on earth yeah that there's only one explanation and so that irritates me even if i'm watching like a really good well-researched documentary yeah and and this this is i like i get that these ep- these episodes are not meant for people that are uh are like they're not it is not geared for experts it's not geared to be presented but like i noticed it really kind of clicked with me on this second week of watching how broad all of the information they give you is and the lack of like specificity and specifically specificity that would make it weirder and less believable like they sand off the rough edges of all these stories so that they're just weird circumstances that no one really knows for sure what they saw but they probably saw something it might have been a prank but probably not on like all of these episodes and and meanwhile you're sitting there going i know everything about that and i know you're not telling this part of it that makes it seem less plausible yeah like it they're they're very 
Especially the fourth episode. The fourth episode. You ep- kept saying, there's a whole thing about that that they're not saying, and I don't know why. There, There's like, the fourth episode is so fucking weird in that it it's it's kind of about UFOs over the Fukushima meltdown point. But it's also kind of about how Japanese culture, I guess, makes you more willing to believe in, like, be willing to live side by side with the unknown. Yeah. But also about, like, a light being alien person that lives in Japan that they, is, like, basically a star seed, but they never say it. That it's, episode, this this fourth episode, it it does the very cool, not at all problematic thing that a lot of American documentaries like to do. Which uh, make it seem like every person born in Japan feels a certain way about all things. That like everyone yeah. in Japan is just agreed. Because you were born in Japan, you therefore think this. You're more polite. That's like a thing. They, yeah. they People pe- people in American documentaries love to be like, I just love the Japanese people. They're so polite and well-spoken and whatever. And I'm always like, you're being racist. Yeah. Just because you're saying something and- good doesn't mean it's not racist. But this documentary... Like walked a fine line of almost saying shit that you could just straight up say was racist, but they never quite so, said it. There was probably like so much on the cu- on the cutting room floor of them being like, "Oh no, we got to rephrase that one." Yeah. Like just a, and, take this word out and use this like, word instead. In my opinion, maliciously cutting together actual quotes from the Japanese people to simplify them. Yeah, And they did that throughout all four of these documentaries. That is like my core complaint about it is that they were like so obviously really heavily editing people to change the meaning of what they were saying. But I think that they were doing it to the Japanese people in a way where like if you just watched any of those interviews with the people speaking Japanese Mm -hmm. and you took off the dub and just had it subtitled with them talking where you could just hear their voice, hear their intonation and read subtitles of what they were saying. Yeah. And they didn't chop it up as much as they did. And you just heard something that one of them said. I think that you would have a completely different takeaway about all those people than how the documentary presents them. But I don't know because I'll never see that. But I just sometimes stuff just gives you that kind of feeling where I'm like, I think I'm being fucked with here. Yeah, it didn't help. Okay. This is this is entirely a tangential point that is just about the fourth episode. Uh, but one of the 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 first literally the first voice in the episode is a guy that helps run a monastery uh, that's like a long term monk. And the person they chose to dub his voice, he dubs two people, too. He does. The other guy, that other older guy later in the episode gets dubbed by the same guy. Yes. Uh, but the voice he uses specifically for the monk sounds so much like rich fulcher specifically in season one of the mighty boosh it's it is like it was really hard to concentrate i kept expecting the guy on the screen to put a cup in his pocket or something like you know what it really sounded like him and it's because like the guy the the choice that that the voice artist was making was trying to follow the cadence and intonation of a japanese speaker without sounding taking on any of the cultural stuff that would be deemed racist yeah so he just was a little stunted and like gruff yeah and it just it ended up sounding so much like fucking rich vulture yeah what were you gonna say i was gonna say you told me that this was gonna be episode 420 and i said what if we did a cheech and chong bit at the beginning yeah and then you said but we're white and i was like oh yeah i can't do that can i in a purely audio medium Mm -hmm. i can't just sit here and do an impression of cheech marin yeah that probably wouldn't go down smooth yeah for almost anyone on earth (laughs) What if someone was like really fucking stoned listening to this podcast and they just thought Cheech Marin was on it? Uh, that would be pretty cool, actually. Yeah. I like Cheech and Chong. I'll I, go. Out, I'll go out there. Look, I'll say it. I'll just say this: my main uh, place that I've seen Cheech and or Chong is that is, is and Tommy Chong on that, that seventy is? show. Okay, no, I, I know it's Tommy Chong. You said and or, and so I was like, do you not know? I just, I just mean that I haven't seen much of them to speak of, and I'm not super familiar with their actual act and only really know it from Tommy Chong. But Niall, you watched, I forget the name of the show. What was the name of the show? The Guy Fietti show where they played the party games and Cheech was on. We watched an episode of this. 
in I a vaguely hotel remember with this. my mom or something. I it was vaguely very remember weird it, circumstances. But I do and not we remember watched a whole episode is. of it. I'm pretty sure you were there for this. And but Cheech Marin was no, on. you're right. I was there for this, but I, I even though I can, I remember it happening. I do not remember anything about that show existing. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, happy four twenty. Yeah, there you go. Happy, we're, yeah, this is episode four hundred twenty. Uh, we didn't plan any cool weed bits. No, we just watched. <laughs> we watched a, a part two of a documentary miniseries. Um. So, I mean, we're talking about the fourth episode. Do you want to just talk about that instead and, and we'll do three next or do you want yes. to go back? Let, let's, let's so let's just stick on four. So the main the main thrust of this episode is the main. OK, the main incident they're talking about is the Fukushima meltdown um, and the fact that after the the meltdown, people saw or even while it was happening, uh, people saw lights over the area. And then during cleanup, they would see lights various places and kind of looking into what Japanese people think those those things were versus what like the larger UFO community talks about it. And it's weird that they picked up. This was the episode that they started to to just like randomly um, bring in the. uh Oh no! What? I'm sorry. I'm about to say something. I'm not certain. I want to double check. It was in this episode, not the other one. Say it, and I'll tell you. Uh, was that this the episode that they brought in the ultra terrestrial hypoth? No, because that was in Britain with the fairies, wasn't it? The you didn't finish saying anything the, that you're saying. The ultra. So what? The the idea that they're not extraterrestrials but from another dimension, and no, they brought that, about uh, Jacques Vallée. The guy. There, there definitely were two people on the Japanese episode who said something similar. I don't know where that idea was introduced. No, it was, they were talking about Welsh fairies. So it was the third episode. Yeah. Okay. It was Welsh, right? Yeah. He was saying Welsh fairies are like that. Yep. Yeah. So that was the third episode. Okay. But the guy who was talking about Astro Boy talked about a very similar thing. Yes. Astro Boy? Uh, yeah, it was Astro Boy, then Ultraman, then Studio Ghibli. Yes. <laughs> Which we'll talk about. I just moved my microphone. Is that okay? I moved in my chair enough yep. that I thought I had to move it. Okay. All right, I'm going to get this back in because I'm, I'm going to just take it before that point and start something else. Okay. So the the like prevailing idea that they kind of get across with this this whole lights over Fukushima thing is like from the outside world, people are talking about it as as like aliens or some sort of uh, uh, galactic thing. So they bring up this concept of these like fireball soul things that they call Hinatama. Um, and this is brought up mostly by a cleanup worker who is doing cleanup, uh, volunteering for the Fukushima fallout, like years after the fact. Uh, and he's talking about how, when he would, he, one day he was on the beach and they went down and uh, with a group of people doing cleanup and, uh, cause you know, after this, the, the tsunami and everything, bodies would just wash up on the shore and they would find sometimes survivors, sometimes whatever. Uh, and he saw these lights and the lights were like positioned over this wrecked car where the the like where the people that were dead inside were so these are instead of being uh separate entities from somewhere else coming down these lights would instead be more of a representation of dead people's souls escaping up to heaven or whatever uh after death during this disaster which is like a, a much different theory than the alien like because the rest of it the the alien theory boils down effectively to like space brothers like they're coming down here to warn us off of uh, nuclear power and nuclear proliferation and all that kind of stuff and trying to keep us from, like, blowing ourselves up and everything. Um, and they even get into talking about uh, some of the, like, historical Space brothers type stuff to kind of bring that idea. They never call it that. Uh, but Jul <laughs> Jules has, has heard me just yell, they're doing fucking Space, yeah, bro like, space Brothers like six other six different times during the course of this miniseries. Now, okay, the whole premise here is I'm fucking joe blow doesn't know as much about it right. as you right so here's what i'll say about that when i hear that as an idea oh they're here to warn us because we're developing nuclear weapons and they're worried about it and they're kind of watching over us and supervising us we're language like that was being used supervision yes chaperoning almost you know what i mean that's how a lot of the people in the documentary were talking about it i hear that and i'm going okay well, what year was the initial the lights? What what are we talking uh, about? So the Fukushima disaster was twenty 
12, I believe. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. How many years? That, us still using nuclear energy and still developing nuclear weapons and Mm -hmm. all of that. It's been decades that we as a society have just been flagrantly, openly, as a as a as humanity, mm-hmm. developing nuclear weapons and continuing to use the nuclear threat as like a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, what are the how much are they fucking they're not very good chaperones if yeah, they're chaperones like, is my point. Like I don't know how to say it. Exactly. But whenever I hear the people saying like they're here to warn us or whatever, I'm like, well, they could probably do it in a little bit more of an effective way if they want to actually warn us off this shit. Yeah, they're kind of the they're kind of the the effectiveness level of like a principal in an 80s comedy. Yeah. Like it's it's (laughs) if they actually are so advanced that they know what nuclear energy is and are like, oh, we already figured out that that's not worth the pain that it causes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to warn you that you're hurting the planet and each other more than is worth by using nuclear energy. Um, I think that if that was true and they were actually so advanced that they had learned those lessons already and they were trying to save us from ourselves, then they would probably actually land a ship in a populated place and say, listen, assholes... You got to stop with the nuclear shit. We're going to fuck you up if you don't fucking cut it out or whatever. But instead, they they blink these like warm glowing lights and they just implant the idea that maybe you should be nice to the planet. But and just like, for like a couple people. Yeah. They only give that idea to just like a couple people yeah. and move on. And people who are not in any position to influence that. Yeah. Just random people. It's never like a, a head of state being like and the aliens told me this is the way and i get that that's also i mean i'm sort of making i don't know exactly what the word for that is i made a bad point because they probably aren't elected officials because yeah if you said that no one would elect you to office but i (laughs) i just think it would be a more widespread campaign if they were actually worried about us hurting the planet Mm -hmm. like if that was some if there was some uh intergalactic fucking force and like uh, a a united nations of the galaxy that they all decided hey humans on earth are really fucking shit up and we need to nip that in the bud they would go about it in a slightly different way yeah and like it's so this episode the thing that i think okay I, I'm I'm having trouble like linking things together because my brain is just firing random shit from this episode. But the th- one of the, another one of the things that just stuck out to me was the only like actual Japanese culture we referenced ever was like three different anime things, and that's it. And specifically, the one that really just stuck out to me for for reasons is the fact that they decided to reference Ultraman, but. Ultra, okay, for those that don't know, Ultraman is a incredibly long running since like the 60s uh, live action series about uh, a group of alien beings from this this planet that come down and either fuse with people from Earth or uh, trade bodies or stuff like it. So it's, it's an alien visitation show where they help people like deal with monsters. It's a they, they fight monsters and it's this like pretty major thing in Japan. It's, it's it, like, there's, there's even now like Ultraman rising was on Netflix this year, whatever. It's so there's cultural relevance, but instead of referencing the long running mini seasons, like important TV show Ultraman that has existed in some form or fashion the entire time, they reference a short lived anime because they were talking about other anime. And it just, it is like the weirdest. It's like, Here's what, here's what I'll say about how you're interpreting this. Yes. This is how you phrased it while we were watching it that way too. Yeah. Here's what it actually was. The guy that was being interviewed referenced Ultraman as a character and did not specify the medium. And then the lazy documentary didn't want to work that hard. And so they just used a clip from anime because the other clips that they were going to use were from animes. And it was probably easier to clear the fucking licensing on the anime. Yeah. And or cheaper or whatever, faster, whatever it was. Because I'm pretty sure the anime things they were using were released in the US, not really as much in Japan. So I think that it was simply what was the first clip? I remember uh, it was Astro Boy. 
Because, yeah, it was Astro Boy, then it was the anime of Ultraman, and then it was Studio Ghibli. Yes. And I, Ghibli? I am never certain. I never. I don't say it out loud often enough in front of people who would know. Keep, so look, you I all alternate. know what we're talking about. Um. Uh. So I think that that is much more just like the lazy documentarians didn't work that hard on that. That's totally fair. It just is like it's like a weird. The guy said Ultraman, so somebody searched Ultraman and went, "Well, we could clear that pretty easily." Yeah, it, it's just like a strange thing. And pick. also, Americans do assume that Japanese people only watch animated things that look a certain way. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that that is like so much of this fourth episode was just playing into an American idea of Japanese people. Yeah. In a way that I found really condescending, like really, really, really condescending. And then they'll like randomly just launch into like the Space Brothers thing that I was referencing earlier that, that they launch, went into was... Uh, the supposed times that uh, uh, aliens have come down in ships and disabled nuclear weapons at U.S. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons facilities. And they, they cite two of them and interview one of the guys that was involved in the first and the major one. Um, and they then link this to the Fukushima stuff as like these aliens are coming down in, in places with nuclear warheads. And this is like a prevailing theory that. Uh, a lot of people think that aliens are very interested in sites with nuclear technology, and that's like a common thing. So I get the illusion they're bringing there. Like, I get why those things are linked together here. It just then, like, is linked with all this other stuff with about, like, just basically making it seem like, oh, yeah, Japanese people are just really nice, really good about being mystical and not having things explained because they're okay with unknowing in a way they're, we Western minds can't be. They're very spiritual people. <laughs> it's It's just weird. Like... I don't, I guess it's not that like, have you ever read the, there's a thing that goes around. I honestly don't remember who wrote it or for what, but there's like an article where it's like someone writing about a cheeseburger, the way that Bon Appetit writes about yep. like quote unquote exotic cuisine. Yeah. And it's like this American staple, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It really feels like at any moment they should be playing the most stereotypical Koto music. Yes. Like the, it's, you're going to get that drop any second. You in could, this episode. I, I also think I'm fairly certain that a lot of the people that they interviewed were wearing, uh, a t-shirt and jeans and that the documentarians said do you have any like traditional garb <laughs> yeah. that you could put on because there would be multiple things where you see the person in one outfit and then the next time you see them they have some kind i don't know what the different things are called yeah. okay i'm not going to try to name and them. different people are wearing different things so i'm not going to try to name check all of them but like things that you would associate as an american with being japanese clothing mm -hmm. i just feel like it's like i said last episode about uh the they talked to the teacher at the school and they had her speaking in Spanish. Yeah. I think that there's just a lot of like the, the people who made these documentaries, they think that something being foreign lends it credibility. Yep. And like with a lot of Americans, that's true. Things mm -hmm. seem more legit for some reason, if they're from another country. And I don't, I couldn't, I analyze that that that's, deeply. That's one of those. Well, yeah, I mean, it, the thing that I don't know where that idea comes from, but it definitely is either. an American idea I, I that I've experienced in America. Yeah. And and like, I think that that is the best. I think you kind of un un unintentionally stumbled on like what I think is the thesis of this show is this show is trying to look for anything they can other than facts to make you think that these things that they're presenting are real and should be looked at with validity when in reality they're giving you like just the most bare bones version of it that doesn't really explain the truth of these scenarios. And it just, it just leaves you being like, Oh yeah, people probably did see some weird shit and that's all you're supposed to take out of yeah. it. Yeah. And I just, I just want to be very clear. I haven't done a bunch of research on the actual people who made these episodes. Right. I think that one guy did direct all four of them or was it just the first I two think were so, the same guy? But I'm not certain. It doesn't, but that doesn't even really matter to me. I'm just saying what I, what I want to say is I don't know if the director is American. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of the crew is American. I know Amblin is American. I know Steven Spielberg is American. And I know that the mentality of this thing is a very American production style. Yeah. So when I say all those things, that's what I'm talking about. I'm saying, I think that this is 
made for Americans to watch on Netflix yes. primarily. And so that's why I'm saying all those things. I don't, but I don't know the crew of people who made it, but I am picturing that there were a lot of hands on these things. It It's not like a traditional documentary where you might have a small crew of people who are by and large in charge of the uh, content. Mm -hmm. This feels much more to me like uh, it's an episode of I Love the 80s or something. Yeah. There's a crew of people who there's a house style that you have to make it fit, and then it gets edited down to fit that house style. And that's how this felt to me. There's an Amblin house style. You interview a bunch of people, and you try to cut it together in a way where you can make it feel like an Amblin thing. Yeah. And the, the, the modus operandi for this episode is you have to be able to say at one point in, in each episode, Hundreds of people saw this. Yes. And how could they all be lying? Yeah. And that's the thing is like that one bothers me the most out of all the things that you could say. There's no, there's no other explanation because when hundreds of people say the exact same thing. More often that means that they all agreed to do that in some way. Yeah. People are not do not have reliable memories. Eyewitness testimony in court is one of the most fallible things, okay? Mm -hmm. Whenever people are like, but you, we had an eyewitness who saw the crime. People are wrong about what they saw. People remember shit wrong. They, they also, human eyeballs are not that reliable. And so whenever people say that, I'm always like, well, if a hundred people saw exactly the same thing, they're repeating something. Yeah, they're not there, there's a organically they all seeing that. I liked uh, there's we'll get into this in the third episode, uh, but was it I think it was in that one where they, they brought up the fact that someone was like, I know for certain Forbidden Planet was showing on TV around that time. And everyone was like referencing basically the iconography of Forbidden Planet. They when showed they were the clip about the, of the spaceship from Forbidden Planet and it was it looked like the thing from Forbidden Planet. Yeah. And okay. So uh, one of the other bigger things that gets brought up in this episode that we haven't talked about yet is they do bring up the Utsurobune, which is a thing that I did an episode on years ago on the main feed, which is this historical sighting of this uh, strange craft that washes up off the shore uh, and a woman comes. They, they they open it up and there's a strange woman inside. Uh, and they they put this up basically as like, you know, people think that the earliest UFO sighting was, was uh, in 1947. But I found this historical one that shows that it, Japan had the first UFO sighting and it's it they they go into the Utsurobune thing without really like a lot of detail or context because it's just they basically just the guy supposedly finds the beach where the craft washed up and that's enough evidence for him um, and they give a brief rundown that that the various people uh, saw this craft with the three windows they opened it up. And there was a woman inside. And so that's let, basically all the information they give you. That's all they say in the documentary. Yeah. You have done an episode on that. I know it was a long time ago. Yeah. Is there more to that that implies that that woman is an alien? Because the guy kept saying it like, and that there was an alien inside. But all of the pictures that they were showing and textually all he said was that there was a woman, a strange woman. That's, that's the thing. It's, it is. Because I was like, how does that prove that that's a spacecraft? There was a weird thing in the ocean and a woman was inside. What are you talking? That's all he said over and over. Yeah. And I, he kept saying it like, then this is the first UFO. And I was like, no one saw it come out of the sky. It washed up on the beach and there was a woman inside. That just sounds like a weird thing that happened. Yeah. Uh, but, but is there more okay. truth that implies that she's an alien? So textually, no. Uh in, Somehow I thought that was in what terms you're in terms of the way that it has been embraced by the UFO community. They they will read a lot of symbols and stuff into the, into those things. The drawings of the thing look like a UFO. Exactly. But that doesn't mean shit, because guess what? A UFO is the simplest shape that a thing can be. So many things look like that. Yeah. This lamp looks like a UFO. Did aliens bring it here? The fuck are you talking about? Now you're dog? just now you're just writing an ancient aliens book. So I the thing you know what one of the hardest things in life is? Uh-huh. I could so easily be a fucking swindler. I know how to talk to these people. And I could a, a, a gullible person who wants to believe, I could so easily be like, I saw an alien. 
And I could scam people if I wanted to Mm -hmm. because they make it easy. And that would be a solid paycheck, dog. It would pay more than this podcast pays. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Because I'm paying to be on right now. But guess what? Yeah. I'm too good. You got too much of a moral backbone. I'm such a cool, great person. And that's the main thing I want to get across on this podcast. That's the big point of this episode for sure. If you're listening to this, I'm really fucking great. Yeah. I'm cool. You're right. 100%. Uh, Sorry. As you were saying that, I scrolled down my notes and was reminded of of our cultural critic guy saying, going on about how Japan doesn't really have a religion or a Ten Commandments or anything like that. Him saying that, I was like, guess what? America doesn't either, dog. Like, technically, dude. Yeah. We don't have a religion. We're not supposed to. And a lot of people in America are atheists. Like, I was like, what are we talking about here? Yeah, especially because the thing that it comes around to is effectively, like, because Japanese people aren't Christians, they're going to be starseeds is effectively the point they're making. Because, like, he said that they don't have a religion, and then the only comparison he drew was Ten Commandments. And I was like, guess what? There are also Christians in Japan, though. I Like, what are we talking about here? People absolutely practice Christianity. Did Liam Neeson die for nothing? (laughs) Short answer, yes. (laughs) If you watch Silence, kind of, yeah. And if you haven't watched Silence, you should watch Silence. But also, no. (laughs) Do you want to get into interpreting the end of Silence? Andrew Garfield died for nothing? Yes and no. Yeah. Hmm. Depends on on your, your, uh, uh, you know, depends on your stance. Um, man, such a good fucking movie. Silence is a perfect film. It's so good. If you haven't seen Silence, if if there if you have any hangups about it, fucking text me, bro. Yeah, I will talk to you about Silence till the cows come home. Going that we got that Discord mo- movie TV channel for a reason. I think that Silence is probably like the most underrated Martin Scorsese movie. Probably followed maybe only by like bringing out the dead. Sure. Like what, what about like some, after hours? There are some that, but like after hours, I think right now is getting kind of a cult reevaluation. Got a, a bit of a where renaissance. People are like, we all like after hours, right? Griffin Dunn. Yeah. I and, think but so. like, do you ever hear Nicholas Cage was in a Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, there is a You're Martin right. Scorsese movie from the nineties starring Bing Rames and Nicholas Cage. No one fucking talks about that. Okay, dog. No one talks about it. But it happened, and it's really good, and you would like it. I'm you sure I would. I need to see it. But I think that like that is one of the most undersung ones. No one talks about Alice Doesn't Live Here anymore, but yeah. I don't know if I would say that's like criminally underrated as much as it is just like people don't realize that he directed a movie that's like a drama about a woman who falls in love with Chris Christopherson. Yeah. That's a Scorsese movie, which yeah. I think is surprising to a lot of people. But like... I think Silence is the most underrated. I I would agree. It's it is a perfect movie, and I don't think anyone who's in it. I I think arguably everybody in it is giving the performance of their career, and that's like those are the movies that I love, where it's just like everyone is firing on all cylinders, and like there there are other movies for Adam Driver especially that would be in contention. Like I think he's incredible in Annette. Uh, like I I like you would I like that movie a lot. Yeah, um, you're a sick puppy. <laughs> You but love Annette. I do. Uh, but, but like, man, he's good in silence. Silence is so good, though, is the thing. It is, yeah. And, but, I mean, like, as I was saying it's the most underrated, I'm kind of like, I could make a really strong argument that The Irishman is the most underrated yeah. for how much it gets shit on. But it's so highly discussed that I feel weird labeling it underrated. Yeah. But, like, it's mostly discussed for people to be like, sure, The Irishman, but they all look so old. And I'm like... Do you have a brain in your fucking head? The Irishman is perfect, okay? Yeah. Who wants to talk to me about Scorsese? Line up, everybody. Give me your Scorsese hot takes. And guess what? I'll explain why they're wrong and I'm right. Because as we've established on this podcast, I'm great. Yep. I'm cool. I'm great. You know what you're doing at all times. Uh, so there's only other one little, one other thing that we haven't really talked about. They do have like a religious studies person on here that talks about the, the crucifixion or the, uh, stigmata of St. Francis Mm -hmm. as kind of a, like, I don't think they knew exactly what they were going for with this episode to begin with and kind of figured it out (laughs) because like they basically were just trying to say like, you know, belief is important 
and uh, belief is like a, a really uh, it, it it kind of unites. It's one of the things that unites like a country and like has. Which uh, person said that about the stigmata? Do you remember uh, the stigmata? What they it's the like? woman. It was the religious studies woman. No, I know, but what they look like? Uh, it was a it was a uh, like kind of reddish blonde woman, maybe mid. Was she the one who was she when she first started talking? She was like, I think this is really important that we talk about this because I'm a skeptic kind yeah. of. But then everything she said was bullshit. I was like, I really thought she was going to have more to say. Who? What was the woman? You the, there were the meditation expert. That was her. That's the same woman. Cause she, no, because there was another woman who also was talking about religious stuff who had like glasses. That was her. No, because I'm talking about the the meditation woman didn't have glasses and she had more straight up red hair. And red lipstick. This is what I mean. I don't remember everybody's names. Yeah. But the one woman was really driving me nutsy cuckoo. And the other one slightly less so. Fair. I'm trying to remember the distinction here. Because, like, I the, basically, there was one woman that was brought in as, a, as like, a PhD religious studies person. I looked it up, and, and she seems to be doing work in meditation. And it just, like... The cr- I don't remember what the other woman did for a living. Though. I don't either. But she was like halfway all right. But this lady sucked ass. Yeah. So it, it was just like, I, I truly, I was really hoping, I thought like the, after the first two episodes, I really thought, oh, this miniseries exists because of the Tic Tac UFO footage. And it's going to be kind of grappling with kind of disclosure in our modern era with that. That footage didn't show up in episode three or four. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they dropped that entirely. That just happened to be in the first two episodes and not mentioned again after. But then in this fourth episode, they kept showing the exact same two second clip of these lights. Correct. And but they were showing it after people's accounts of things that happened years after that. Correct. In a way that was extremely frustrating to me because they weren't labeling it. They just showed the clip. And if you are half watching this while you're scrolling on TikTok it's going to seem like there's footage of all these different events and like the footage is documenting the thing that's being talked about. And that's what that is supposed to imply. Yeah. This is like when we, t- have I ever talked about get back on this podcast? No. Cause I have a whole thing about get back, which we never finished watching actually. And we should watch the last episode of, but when we were watching get back, I love the Beatles. You're fine with the Beatles. Uh, yeah. So when we wanted to watch it, it was very much more like, I was exploring a fandom that I had had as like a child growing up. Now I'm an adult who still loves the Beatles Mm -hmm. and I wanted to watch this thing. And it was this big deal that everybody was making. Oh, there's this footage that you've never seen before, blah, blah, blah. And in get back throughout the whole thing, there is footage of the Beatles with no sound that they put sound that didn't have footage over. Yes. Or there's footage that had sound that they took the sound off and add sound from a different time over. Correct. That is extremely misleading. And I think it is a dangerous practice in documentaries to state, to present something as this is a document of something that happened and you are doctoring it to that extent. Because with Get Back, the stakes are very low. You're putting John Lennon's facial expression over words that he said when he probably didn't look like that while he was saying it. Yeah. And someone's body language and facial expression can change the meaning of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So I still think that that is misleading to your audience because you're saying, oh, John Lennon was sitting in very relaxed and happy while he said this, or he seemed agitated while he said this, but I don't know what he actually looked like when he was saying it because you don't have footage of him saying it. So just play the audio over a fucking picture like documentaries are supposed to do. This to me is a very similar issue where it's like it's bordering on deep fake territory with some of this shit where I'm like, you're creating footage of something and you're putting words over it, describing an event that makes it seem like the footage is of the event that you're describing. Yeah, what el- what other that. conclusion are you supposed to draw from that? That's what they want you to think. Yeah. Like they're. Because the, the the clip they're using is of uh, just a basically a static shot over the sea with a series of lights and kind of a geometric ish pattern. Uh, and it's it is the first time it's presented. It's labeled as footage from Fukushima 2012. And then after that, where it's brought back in varying levels of zoomed inness, 
uh, which is, I think, maybe the thing that swings me to more to your side on this than even on the get back stuff. Uh, yeah, because you're not as concerned about the get back. I'm stuff. not. But guess what? I'm great. I you're great, and I think you. I think I think <laughs> if if we take out the fact that it doesn't like whether or not it bothers me is not the deciding factor, and whether or not I think that you have a point that it's a weird slope. I think you're right, even on get back. It just doesn't bother me specifically. But in this, they literally are taking the same little static shot of just like someone's like cell phone footage uh, of this of the these lights, and then they will zoom it into different degrees and cut even from one larger zoom out to a, a close up zoom in over the same audio that's then recounting an entirely separate event from a different time period, and. And they played the footage like a million times just over people talking about stuff generally. Yeah. They just used the exact same three second clip and they looped it. Like it just was like so being manipulated where I was like, you cannot present this as if you are just presenting facts of a case. If you're going to manipulate the footage as much as you are. Yeah. It it really wants to act like it's just trying to very unbiasedly let people tell their stories. But the documentary itself is so curated by committee <laughs> and I think uh, with this- that it, it just it feel everything gets toothless and like jumbled in a weird way. I think with this fourth episode, they had this one idea about the lights, but there was not enough content. So they just started adding other ideas into it to pad it out for an hour. Yeah. Exactly. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about the fourth episode, though, or no. do you want to talk about the third? Uh, let's talk about the third for a little bit, because I don't think this one is as interesting, but al- almost just because it's it's better and just, like, fine, you know? Yeah. Uh, My biggest takeaway about the fourth one, I'll just say quickly, is that I liked a lot of those people, and I would like to see a documentary where those people get to actually talk. Yeah. A lot of the people in the, like, at Japanese people with firsthand accounts those people seemed really interesting and like they had something interesting to say. Mm-hmm. And I think that they were getting really edited down. Yeah. I, the, the, the light bringer woman, I would be very curious to hear better how she describes what she believes and who, what she thinks she is. Because even in just the edit we got of her, it seemed like they were very much shaping what she was saying to a point where I don't know if I really know what she believes. Um, so, yeah, like, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, so the third episode is about the Broadhaven Triangle. Uh, largely, this is a mass sighting event in, in Britain, uh, 1977. It's the largest mass sighting in UK history. Supposedly, at least 450 people saw something over the course of a, a, a time period. Um, and the Broadhaven Triangle is referring to the three main, as far as I can tell. They never explicitly state this. This is what really bothered me about the title of this episode. They start with three accounts. Yeah. And I thought, great, a triangle. And they kept showing those three accounts on a map. Yeah. But it didn't really make a satisfying triangle. Correct. It made an extremely obtuse triangle. Yes. And that's fine. Very skinny. I still was like, okay, it's a triangle. There's two points here. One is slightly more inland. Mm -hmm. And they're all seeing the same thing. But then later in the episode, it widened the map out and it just threw a bunch of dots on the map. And it was like, actually, a way more people saw this shit. Yeah. And we're just not going to get into any of that. And then it just drew a lazy triangle over those dots. Yeah. So I was like, is that the triangle? Because we spent the whole episode talking about three people. And then you're kind of like, but the triangle's actually just everybody in yeah. this area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as far as I can tell, what, what was set up as the triangle in my mind was uh, the school sighting, which they didn't give the name of the school, but it's the local elementary school in, in this Broadhaven a- area. Then this uh, uh, this hotel um, called the um, Havens Hotel or Havens Fort Hotel. The signs didn't really agree when they would go look at different ones. Uh, and then finally... This- it was like a historical building that used to be a fort. Right. So I think sometimes it's called the fort and sometimes it's not. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, the the farm home of the family of uh, Billy and Pauline Coombs were the three main sighting areas. Now, then, like you said, they eventually brought in this little island off the coast that looked like it was going to be part of the triangle. But then we already had three places, so I got confused. And then right after that, people just started seeing shit everywhere. They started going down this, like, random dirt path where multiple people saw it. Then they started going down, like, uh, in various, like, 
valleys and shit. Like it just it it broadened and everyone was seeing them everywhere. So I don't know what the triangle is. But so correct me if I'm wrong. Here, okay. Though. In this episode, I feel this is the other thing that was bothering me about. It's hundreds of people saw it. How could you say that they're all lying? I feel that the accounts of what happened with these people are all pretty fucking different. I think yeah. a lot of them are really different. There's, there's, and I don't get why they're acting like these people all saw the same thing. I think they all saw different shit. There, there's, there are like two main things that people see in this. There's people who see a silver man either with or without a craft near him. And then there are people who see weird lights in the sky. But sometimes the man is human sized. Sometimes he's eight feet tall. Correct. Sometimes he has facial features. Sometimes he his face is covered. Yeah. Sometimes, you know what I mean? And I was just like, these people aren't all seeing the same thing. Yeah. And like you even get just like quickly tossed off that uh, there's this as is becoming a fucking trope. If, if we want to start adding to our bingo card for UFO sightings uh, nearby somewhere that uses uh, heat protective gear that near like a factory or a smelting factory or something like that, because that there is that here. And there's a local place that where people wear a lot of shiny silver heat protective gear, where there was even one of those suits was on display in a local shop in a window nearby where all these sightings were happening. And so like a lot of the, the just basic small, like normal sized up to seven foot silver man, which is what I would consider something that you could mistake a normal person for are probably a prank from this episode. And they do explicitly say that someone came forward and Correct. said they were pranking. But then the documentary explicitly says to you, the viewer, that person might have done it because it really happened, though. Yeah, they, it they really basically... happened. And so they got the idea to do it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? But the one that the, this so... documentary will not entertain the idea that they're that it's not an alien. They, it will not. It doesn't let the crack of well, air in at all. See, but you're you're. You're mistaking one thing from this episode, though, because they they think that maybe it's also fairies, but that those are the same thing because it's all like this cultural. Because it's just uh, how modern people interpret the fairies. Yeah, so we're people, fairies are old fashioned, so we think they're aliens, but really it's just the fairies. But I think that what like it's not saying that. Okay, so this is maybe this is how I took it, and I don't know if this is a thing that I took because I have read about Jacques Vallée, who does get name dropped and, and a little clip of him gets played in this episode. Uh, I've read about the ultra terrestrial hypothesis and all this stuff. To me, it sounded like they were saying there is something weird that people at different times throughout history have, have interpreted as these different things. And what they see it as is reflective of the culture at the time. Not that they were saying it's fairies. We just think there are UFOs now. Is that what you think? What's they the were... difference between what you just said though? Say the first way you said it again. So in the first way there is, there is a, it's the same thing both times, but it's yeah, not but that, explicitly that's, fairies. That's what I'm saying, too. It's okay. whatever we used to call fairies are still happening now, but we're calling it aliens. Okay, then, yes, we are of the same. Yeah, that's how I took it as well. Because Whatever like, those things are, we used to call them fairies, and now we call them aliens. Yes. So it's this, this like, because that, that's a thing that comes up a lot in UFO lore and people just trying to grapple with the concept of the world of weird in general is this kind of cultural... Um, expulsion like at, at there's there's this kind of tension in culture that gets released by these people seeing these strange things that may or may not be from a natural form and may or may not be based on like people have various theories of like whether it's you know the collective unconscious or uh this like energy that exists between all living matter or whatever the fuck um but it's this like reflection of the collective uh state at the time that it's represented in different ways and that that's kind of the theory of this episode you've got it delves a little bit into the ultra terrestrial hypothesis but never explicitly calls it that um it just is basically saying that maybe they're not from outer space because at the same time it's saying they come out of the ocean a lot so we got to talk about the fact that ufos a lot of times are seen near water um because they live on the shore here in britain People also, everybody in the documentary was using that as like, they would say it and then be like, and that somehow makes it more factually accurate. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what, what connection are you making there? They, well, they're, they're always seen near the water. And I was like, yeah, do you know how many weird optical illusions become more possible when you're looking at a large body of water? Yep. Have you ever seen like a floating ship? 
Mm-hmm. Shit like that. I mean, you've talked about it on this podcast. I was on the episode about <laughs> the ghost ships. Um, th- there is just like, it's such a common thing that human beings look at the water and see some weird shit that's not there. Yep. And so I just was like, why are we not... I would have liked all of these documentaries, all four of them. I'm t- taking each one as its own piece. Yeah. I would have liked them all so much more if they just would have allowed for the idea, had an actual skeptic on to say, this is a phenomena, this is a possible explanation. Because sometimes skeptics don't have a good explanation and mm-hmm. that makes for an interesting documentary too. When a skeptic is like, I don't fucking know what happened. I just don't believe that that's what happened my that's more interesting than when you just get a bunch of believers together and they all go there's no other possible explanation yeah i'm like isn't it more interesting that there are multiple explanations isn't that what documentaries are supposed to be about my yeah. my my favorite type of ufo expert or favorite type of weird person expert is the kind of person that will come in and say yeah about 80 percent of these this one this one this one this one this one we know what these are i still don't know what these are like these couple things, I can't they, really say. I don't. I don't know. I. I. They kept showing the footage of the lights, honestly, in mm-hmm. the fourth episode, and I was like, I don't. I don't have a really good explanation for that because yeah. they are moving in a way that is like I. I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. But also, I'm dumb. That's the other thing about like about all four of these episodes is like, ju- just a bunch of people who either have an education in a very specific area or don't have that much of an education, are sitting and being like. I know for a fact that this is what happened. And I'm like, do you know how much shit I don't know? Do you know yeah. how much shit you don't know? Oh, so much. And I think you're pretty smart. I think you're smarter than me. I say it all the time. And I and, say no. But. <laughs> but I know that people don't know shit. Yeah. Think about th- who's the smartest person you can think of right now who's alive. Me? Oh. Uh... Who are you going to say? The joke was that I said me really quietly. Oh, me. Okay. I thought uh, you were starting a name. I thought no. you were going to say like Mick Jagger or something. No. Uh, no. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. You know how much shit he doesn't know? So and much. actually, that is the mark of an actually really smart person because I think Bill Nye would say we don't know shit. Yeah, and he you know, said it in, in that debate with the, the creationists and supposedly he lost because of it. Fuck and, that. And you know who thinks that he does know everything and isn't actually that smart? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Let's do it. I'm going to start a flame war here, do it. here and now. Here and we, now. We, Kyle and I, I have uh, have been talking about how uh, his nemesis used to be Adam Sandler, and now we, the, the podcast has no nemesis now. So I think we do I need would to figure one out. Love if you guys pick Neil deGrasse Tyson as your nemesis. I hate that fucker. He, no, I don't even. I know almost nothing about him personally. I I don't mean it that way. Yeah. He just is so. Actually, bah, 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 bah. I hate that shit so much. He like, I, he heard, he, you want to go back to I uh, me talking about being in middle school and being obsessed with Stephen Colbert? Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson used to be on The Daily Show and The Colbert Report like a lot on late night in general when he was like at the height of being a personality uh-huh. was when I was at the height of watching that type of programming. And he came on The Daily Show and told Jon Stewart that the earth was rotating in the wrong direction on the intro to the daily show. Cause it shows a globe and it's not even a photo of the earth. Yeah. It's an animated globe. Yeah. And he said, it's rotating the wrong way. And I, at the time I was like, Oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's so funny and smart. And now I think about that and I'm like, imagine being the kind of person who would actually correct someone about that. That's yeah. He's made his entire personality on in in the world as far as as like or at least all the stuff that gets filtered down to me is just him being like an ungodly annoying pedant. BB-8 couldn't actually travel on sand. Well, guess what? It's fictional, Neil. Yeah. It's fictional. And so maybe in Star Wars where this the where the sand is made out of fucking and it's on a planet other than Earth. Yeah. And it's a robot technology that Earth has never seen the likes of. Maybe BB-8 can roll on sand, you fuck. Yeah. Don't be cinema sins, people. Just yeah. don't. Because Neil deGrasse Tyson started out as, isn't the isn't the world amazing? Yeah. Space. There's so much to learn. And that was what was so tempting about him and why we all were like let's make him a cultural figure and then he was like actually i'm going to double down on my whole brand being pedantry yeah 
Why would you do that? Yeah. Your whole brand could be how amazing science is. And instead you were like, actually, that's your I'm whole just going to correct movie science. So lame. Yeah. I, so okay. I, 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 he's my nemesis. Fair. I don't care if he's we the podcast ne- nemesis. One thing that I wanted to, just to bring up because it's it's I don't know if this is a theory that I've I've read before, but it was a point that I thought was interesting that this that this documentary brought up. And that is basically that uh, the pressure, the the um, the reason aliens might be tied to water on Earth, if we were to assume that they are, is that the temperature variation, pressure variation, all those kinds of things that that are like that make up inhabitability are much more consistent from planet to planet underwater than they are on the surface of whatever planet you're on. So if aliens were to go from one planet to another, it would make sense that, that, you know, would be water, water would be that. an easier shift from planet to planet than surface to surface in a lot of cases, which is just like a, a like weirdly mundane scientific observation that, uh, if, if it's true, I don't have the facts. I'm basically bringing this up. Someone tell me if that's true. Uh, if not, I'll try to Google it, but because like, it's the guy who said it in the documentary just said it. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, how do you know that yeah. about other planets? Aren't I a guess, lot of other planets like largely unexplored by us? I like, guess by, by large part, the facts it has like liquid water means that it has to be within some level of like, yeah, which I get range, you know? And I, then, so it, it just tempers the variables a bit, but that's what I'm saying. I don't know for sure. It sounds like it makes sense to me, but it may be total bullshit. And this documentary doesn't really care if it's bullshit or not. Yeah, true. So I can't say, well, they put it in the documentary, so it has to have some kind of validity to it. Yeah. They do not. No one was fact checking this shit. Yeah. They, they just were letting people say shit. Yeah. And encouraging them. And a lot of times editing out when they tried to say a little too much. Like, okay. So we've talked about how basically there's there's a couple different types of sightings here. The one other little sighting thing that I thought was interesting that I'm just going to toss off before we wrap this up is specifically one of the sightings of the man at the Coombs house has him specifically they're on the first floor. They look out the window and they see like crotch up to mid torso of a, of a creature and then run upstairs. And in the second floor floor window, you see the head of the same creature. And that is just a scene I now want in a horror movie. Like, that that should be in fucking alien shit tomorrow. That was the best, like creepiest description slash uh re- dr- dramatic reenactment. Yeah. I was the most bought into that emotionally of like, holy shit, that would be really scary. Yep. That it that does sound scary. And if that happened to me, it would change the whole trajectory of my entire life. Yeah. And yeah, I get that. Real but, shit your pants and die moment. But it also was the only account of the, the one of them being that tall. Yeah. Or being that like near a house or structure, like yeah, it, but it like is... they were the only people who said that they were that tall. Yep. Everybody else, it was just a guy, which yep. is why I think most of them were probably just guys running around in silver suits. Yeah, as a prank, uh, which is fine. That's it. That's interesting in its own way. Everybody. Yeah. When people dress up as Bigfoot and they prank a town, I think that's as interesting as if there was a Bigfoot. Not as interesting, but interesting in a different way to to almost the same degree to me i love hoaxes yeah i find hoaxes as interesting as the idea that i want to believe in things because i just think it's i think people are interesting yeah i I think they're both creations of human expression in a weird way that find that is interesting and i think that that's like that's the biggest letdown of this series to me is that it so didn't want to entertain the idea that people do these things yeah Cause like that to me is what's really interesting is the people, the people who believe that it actually happened to them and the kind of people who would make it up as a, as a joke that like humanity is what's interesting about any of this stuff. Any of the stuff you talk about on the podcast, really? Mm-hmm. I mean, so much of it just boils down to the fact that like, aren't people interesting? That's, that's my interest in, in most of it. Yeah. And I'm, this documentary I'm, uh, didn't seem that interested in people. No, it wanted you to feel warmly about certain people in it but it didn't really take as much interest in them as it wanted you to think it was. And it was making a very, it was like, it wanted you to like the two dimensional caricature of the person. Correct. It didn't really care to get to know the people really well. And I think that there are other things of a similar format that take much more care in what it's doing. And this one to me, 
as a show overall, my rating of it would be that it's very kind of careless. I think okay. it's careless in its presentation. So this this is the thing that we ask at the end of a lot of Fuck Your Documentary episodes that I'm just going to posit, and you can answer this however you see fit. Um, who is this documentary for? Because I have my I have an answer, but the the premise of this is that we're coming at this from two angles. So I want to let you go before I I color your opinion. I think that it is targeted at the audience that almost every show like this on Netflix is targeted at, which is just people eating dinner and scrolling on their phone while it plays in the background. And so I think that it is for that person who's doing that, who already believes in aliens. Like, I think that that is the, it's the main thing is you're probably clicking on this because you think aliens are real and you like to watch stuff about aliens and you're eating a bowl of, uh, fucking frosted flakes mm -hmm. while you get ready for work and check your email and it's just on the tv fair I or you just got home from work and you microwaved a tv dinner yeah and you're like kind of talking to your girlfriend about her day and you just have it on yeah that's so much of like i just was picturing people on their phone doing something else while it's on that's yeah. what netflix makes that's netflix's whole thing yep I, I agree with you. I agree with you about everything except one minor detail. That and, they believe in aliens? Yep. That's that's my thing. I don't think this show is for people who believe you in aliens. You think it's for people to make fun of people who believe in aliens? I think it's for people who think aliens are interesting but don't really consider it too much. That just like, but like they, uh, aliens are in the news, they hear about it, and they're like, oh, a new alien show's on Netflix and turn it on. It's it's for people who are aware of, of aliens in the cultural zeitgeist right now but don't really – care about it beyond that and it's for it's for the kind of person who would go into work the next day and be like i watched this thing on netflix yeah it's 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 tiger king it's yeah. it's a thing trying to take on a cultural moment and put something out there for people to talk about at work yeah i i actually that that is spot on yeah i'm with you yeah, so it's like, but you're you're watching while eating fucking cornflakes a hundred fucking percent. Mm -hmm. It's it's that as well. It's fucking. This is something to turn on while you're cleaning the house. It's like if someone called you in the middle, you wouldn't even pause it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Man, uh, I I gotta find where like the the documentaries made by like passionate people are that aren't absolute lunatics. I love documentaries like that. That's so much of what got me about the love and saucers documentary, because yeah. I feel like that was a documentary that really was trying to make a portrait of that guy. Yep. And it did. I really felt like it's, it's one of the like four that I reference like yeah. consistently as a, as like a template for what a documentary like this should be about an interesting thing that may or may not be real. Yeah. So Yeah. Uh, this has been, uh, we've talked about encounters by that's all it's on Netflix streaming right now. I'm guessing it'll be there forever. Cause they have, they have it. No, not forever. Cause nothing is fucking permanent yeah. anymore, but it's a four episode series. Each, each episode is about an hour long. Yeah. So if you want something to throw on in the background while you eat your frosted flakes, I actually think it's it, great for that. Yeah. It, this, this thing should have been half an hour episodes. Though. I agree so much. I agree with that. Cause they were padding so it padding. out. But if you're just like, you're looking to fill time. If you just are like, you're passing the time, it's a good passing the time activity. Agreed. You could like crochet with it on or whatever. Actually play crocheting, you, you might be watching it too. Yeah. Play your switch. Do something yeah. where you're kind of paying attention more to the thing you're doing. Yeah. But yeah. Cause it's, it's not a quick moving show. But um, I, I don't regret committing to watching all four. No. I'm glad we watched all four. I'm glad that I understand it holistically as like a piece as one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fine that it exists. I'm now I'm now curious to look up the the Broadhaven Triangle and try to parse that out a little better I for bet myself. The episode of it gets weird about that would be better than that than the episode of Encounters. Well, uh, I, yeah, I'm not going to hit that button too hard because I don't know if I'll actually end up doing that episode or not, but we'll find out. Um, so I, th I think that'll wrap us up for this week. This has been, uh, I think it's time to do some business. I was mm -hmm. about to just end it. Just fucking cut it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't plug stuff anymore because yeah. I don't host a podcast anymore and I am not really active on social media. So I don't really plug when I'm on here, but I just wanted to quickly say really sincerely 
that I had kind of a bad day today. I was feeling a little down in the dumps. And it's so fun to be on this podcast with you and to get to do this. And it's so nice to think that maybe there are people who like when I'm on the podcast. And so I just wanted to say thank you if you're listening to this. Uh, I was joking around before about how great I am. I pretty much only do that when I actually feel like shit about myself. And <laughs> Don't it, spill all your secrets. It, it makes me feel better <laughs> to be on this podcast and to do something like this. And I just wanted to thank your dear listeners for letting me be part of it. Because I really love this podcast. I love the people who listen to it. I think it's such a cool thing that you and Kyle do. And I hope that you keep doing it for a really long time. Well, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you said said that last part because a lot of times it's like uh, you know scheduling the recording sessions is is a, a bit of an, an annoying thing. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I'm I'm glad we watched this. I've been kind of curious about it from the Spielberg connection for a long time since it came out. I remember when it got like announced, and I was like, Amblin's doing a fucking UFO documentary, and then it turned out to be way less interesting than I hoped. Uh, but I guess we will go on and take care of some business. Uh, let me see if I can, if I can get through all this. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at IGW podcast, we're on facebook.com slash it gets weird podcast. We're on all your favorite podcatchers from Google play to Apple podcast to Spotify. If you listen to podcasts somewhere, look up, it gets weird. And we're probably there. Uh, and we're also on twitch. Kyle streams on twitch.tv slash it gets weird. I believe, uh, streaming Elden Ring a lot of the time. And we're on Patreon.com at Patreon.com slash It Gets Weird. So we have three tiers, the first of which is just a dollar. It's a thank you jar, basically, for you just to send whatever you want to the show for as long as you feel you you want to do that. Uh, then there's our second tier at $2, where you get a bonus episode every other week. Normally, it's been It Gets Weird TV, where we watch various uh, uh, shows that are dictated to us by a fan poll on our in our in on our Patreon. Um, so you get some input on what we watch. Then at our $5 tier on the off weeks of It Gets Weird TV, you get a variety of bonus shows. Uh, sometimes it's Kyle. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's a group thing. Sometimes it's a movie. Uh, it's all sorts of stuff. But there's like hundreds of bonus episodes, no joke, on there at this time, at the time of this recording. So if you like the podcast and want more in any way, shape or form, there's going to be something for you on our Patreon. And at the $2 tier, you get to join the Discord. Oh, right. $2 and up, you're in the Discord where me, Garrett, Kyle, and Niall all are there regularly. Yep. And you can tag us and hit us up, any of the four of us. Niall and Kyle the most, but me and Garrett are in there too, and we will see it if you tag us. Yep. So, like, if you want to come hang out in the Discord, even if you don't listen to this podcast every week, but you just like it and like the vibe. The discord is fun and cool. And I yeah. like everybody in there. So like, I think that that alone is worth the $2 a month. And, uh, I, like I said before, I just, I like the listeners of this podcast. I think the Patreon's cool. And you also get uh, the main feed episodes two days early on Friday, as opposed to Sunday. Uh, so that now, uh, that is that is the Patreon. We we really do like it. We work hard on it. We put a lot of stuff into it. Uh, and it has facilitated the podcast staying alive and as consistent as it is. Yes. Like you guys donating to the Patreon is what allows Niall and Kyle to like work and have a life, but still keep this podcast going. And it let us get Kyle equipment when we moved to different places. It let like it, it, it has facilitated the podcast. I don't know if I don't know without the Patreon, if it would still be going. I, I can't say that for sure, but it, it's definitely a possibility that the podcast would no longer exist. So, so like, we big really appreciate shouts out you. to everybody who donates. <laughs> and if you mostly just, if you've been just listening on the free feed, I think that like a one month tryout <laughs> at the $2 tier might be cool. Yeah. Even a one month at the $5 tier and then fucking cancel it. Like there's, I'm not your dad. Yeah. And on that note, uh, I guess we'll probably wrap it up for this week. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for continuing to support the show. This has been It Gets Weird, and I've been Niall. Wow. Guess what? What? I have not been 